Let me take this off. This is much better. So hopefully my brain gets a bit of oxygen. Hello, everybody. Uh, so uh, it has been a long day with a lot of interesting talk. So you must be tired. And therefore, I'm going to thank you for your attention before the, the actual talk. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, thank you very much for, uh, for, uh, for inviting me to share uh, our work. Uh, this is uh, what we have done in the last 10 years or so. Uh, the idea is simple. So we were trying to build a bridge between uh, processes that occurs on a cellular level and the brain function using models and simulations. This is basically, I think, what we all do here. And, but uh, what I'm gonna do now is to spend just two minutes on two uh, concepts, if this is working. It is not. What's it? Okay. So two concepts again, no, not exactly the first ones that come to our mind when we think about brain function. This is met metabolism and astrocytes. So let's start with the neurons to explain that. So neurons communicate with, with each other using glutamate. Uh, glutamate is the main neurotransmitter of the brain. And uh, so it is released at the synapses and binds to uh, the receptors located on the neuronal membranes. But not only on neuronal membranes, these are the same receptors in plants. And actually the uh, glutamate receptors are, uh, existed well before the separation be do, be, be between the animal and plants. So um, this is, that means that uh, we have a, 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 a molecule that is actually doing si uh, similar things in different organisms, which brings us to the fact that also the same molecule is doing very different function in one single organism, in the one single cells. In fact, before being a neurotransmitter, glutamate is a central compound of the, of the cellular metabolism in all living systems. It has a variety of functions, including antioxidant systems, production of energy, synthesis of amino acids, and uh, uh, ammonia homeostasis. That, this means that any, any alterations in one of these functions is going to uh, influence neurotransmission. And this is exactly what happens during a lot of pathologies. So, and then and now astrocytes. So without astrocytes, we could never have a neurotransmission at all because astrocytes, so, so let me use the, uh, the pointer here. So uh, these cells are responsible for the totality of reuptake of the glutamate, which is released by neurons and recycled to neurons in the form of non-neuroactive uh, non, uh, non, um, glutamine. So this glutamine glutamate cycle. And, uh, uh, but, but that's not all. So even astrocyte express glutamate receptor so they can sense the activity of neurons respond with the elevation in the intracellular calcium and intracellular calcium in turn modulates the vascular response and also the acceleration of mitochondrial dehydrogenases which is metabolism and this is now without consequences because if I increase this I'm going to interfere with the glutamate glutamine cycles and in turn with the neuronal transmission and that's also there is another thing which is uh, even stri more striking that under some circumstances glut uh, astrocyte release glutamate so in uh, uh, directly exciting uh, at neurons in a process which is called the gliotransmission so there is a lot of literature but essentially astrocytes uh, uh, turned from being a passive uh, uh, a scaffold glue of, of the central nervous system uh, to be one of the most important uh, uh, communication elements also for the propagation and the process processing of information. And so it is, it goes without saying that, that astrocytes have entered slowly into mathematical models that before were only uh, restricted to neurons. And so we have computational glioscience. And uh, we, all, we, we were also jumping into this field. Uh, for instance, we were interested in understanding uh, uh, if the low uh, oscillation of intracellular calcium in astrocytes 
that mediators both the, both the um, uh, cerebral blood flow and uh, the oxidative metabolism has an effect on the bold signal, which is one of the uh, interest of, of our laboratory, but uh, but the in uh, the inclusion of astrocytes into mathematical model of neuronal networks uh, has uh, profound effects. For instance, we see here that they increase dramatically the complexity of the firing pattern of the neurons. They can also influence uh, the short-term plasticity of neurons, and uh, they also uh, keep the neuronal activity under control, so they stabilize the neuronal firing rate. Uh, we, we have reached the point that we, for, to explain some dynamics of the brain, uh, we have models of only astrocytes without neurons, such as this one. So why, why so metabolism and astrocytes are important? But first of all, we know that the cerebral cortex, which is the seat of our cognitive function, is one of the most expensive organ in the, in, in the body. And in humans, this is especially relevant. It, it, it reaches a ratio of 10 to one between the caloric intake and body weight. So the allocation of energy resources uh, is a very important limiting factor, both for the evolution of sensory systems and for the actual function of the brain. For instance, it is important in, uh, in, 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 in stimulus perception, meaning filtering out what is not behaviorally relevant. Um, uh, for, for astrocytes, the importance that for uh, these cells are uh, are considered uh, uh, the primary target of evolution of the set of uh, nervous systems, much more than neurons. So you can see the complexity between the mouse and, and human astrocytes compared to the neurons. Um, and there is uh, also very curious uh, evidence of this fact. If, if there are like um, immunosuppressed, immunodeficient, sorry, uh, mice, they were engrafted with human astrocytes, they display uh, a better uh, learning capacity. So um, how we, uh, how we uh, um, translate this into the interaction between neurons and astrocytes? Well, this is the most uh, uh, used model to explain the neurometabolic coupling. Basically, you have um, sorry, you have uh, glutamate here is recycled by astrocyte. Astrocyte consume as absorb glucose from the blood and metabolize to lactate, and the lactate is then transferred to neurons for utilization. This is called the astrocyte to neuron lactate shuttle. Uh, it is a, a fascinating model, uh, but uh, there, it, after 30 years, 30 years since it was proposed is still an hypothesis. So because this model has, has very important problems, the first of all, the problems is that it, um, it means that the astrocyte only consume uh, a, a minority of the energy budget here, like just uh, around 6%, which is uh, inconsistent with uh, a lot of studies uh, here. I have taken just a bunch of them that uh, essentially show that these cells account for 30% of the energy consumed by uh, by the brain, and we we also use the mathematical modeling here, stoichiometric modeling, to uh, to examine this problem, and we found that the solution of this uh, apparent um, controversy it lies in the movement of ions. So basically, in the in the sodium and potassium movements, basically what we found is that. In order to fit the data, you need to uh, assume that astrocytes take up a lot of uh, potassium. And this potassium here is uh, as a much more relevant energetic consequence than the glutamate. Uh, that astrocyte were involved into potassium homeostasis was proposed in 1965 by Leifert, which was one of the most important uh, experts uh, uh, worldwide of the glial cells. Unfortunately, uh, passed away a couple of years ago. Um, 
so and uh, another another reason for why the astrocyte to neurolactate shuttle is not very good is because the lactate is not get consumed but accumulates so the accumulation of lactate has been demonstrated by a lot of laboratories including ours and we see that in on the scale of minutes we have an increase in the lactate upon stimulation and a decrease of glucose of course glucose is consumed and lactate has been produced but this is also true i'm sorry this is very is a little small but it is also true on the scale of seconds this is a Mm, 500 milliseconds, I think, stimulation in the in the cat brain, and you see that glucose goes down and lactate goes up for every cycle of stimulation. And this is also true on the scale of hours. So, for instance, during the sleep away cycle, you have the lactate goes up, the glucose goes down, and uh, actually lactate has been proposed as a biomarker of the cortical state. Um, so what is a cortical state? I decided to put this video in because it's pretty cool. I don't know if you ever seen that and also to, you know, to keep you awake, but, but essentially this is, uh, this is, uh, I'm sorry, this is, I know it takes a couple of seconds to, to adjust. Okay. This is the, spon sorry. Yeah. Okay. Let's, uh, yeah, so this is the spontaneous activity. This is 20 X. So it's accelerated. It is spontaneous activity in the brain of a mouse that has expressed a GCAM7 protein. So basically, it is, uh, uh, we have a lot of complex activity going, going, going on, which different brain regions communicating uh, between each other. At some points, we inject ketamine silazine. So when it kicks in, you see that the uh, structure completely disappear, and we have the one hertz way, uh, delta wave that, uh, Mauricio was talking about in the previous talk. So uh, this is, is something that is cool because you can actually see what is a change of cortical state. So during uh, this change, if you measure uh, glucose and lactate, we have seen that they, uh, that they change. But another, another important metabolic compound that changes is glycogen. So it goes down during the waking period and is replenished during uh, sleeping. And... Uh, um, uh, guess what? The glycogen is only present in astrocytes. So this is kind of creating a symmetry that we can better, you know, understand what's going on. And uh, of course, when you think of glycogen, uh, you, you normally, uh, uh, you think of liver or muscle, muscle, skeletal muscle. And uh, um, it, until 1991, as you can see here, but, uh, but in fact, until 2000s, uh, in the brain, uh, uh, the glycogen was thought to have no relevant role. And, uh, but it is not like that much, uh, it's not like that. Fortunately, uh, this situation changing and now, as we, as you see here, we have uh, a book, which is uh, entirely dedicated to brain glycogen metabolism. So, uh, we can started contributing to this topic by, uh, developing a biophysical model of the glycogen molecule to, to understand where, how, and, uh, if the, this molecule uh, was actually used during sensory stimulation. And using this model together with the uh, carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy, we actually measure in the brain in vivo in humans for the first time that uh, the concentration of this polysaccharide is actually very high, much more than previously thought. And when we translate this to the content in astrocytes, it's kind of the same concentration that we have in muscles. So we get very passionate about glycogen as you can see we published a bunch of papers that we based on mathematical modeling we did uh, some hypothesis the first of that was that glycogen was implicated in the reuptake of potassium by the astrocytes and uh, you know there were someone which is uh, incidentally life the, the same life first so almost i think 50 years uh, after his initial proposal uh, you know to uh, took our suggestion seriously, they measured the, the uh, potassium intake into astrocytes that were completely abolished when they inhibited glycogen metabolism. 
uh, and we of course celebrated this uh, this important discovery with them. So now the, impo the, the, the importance of astrocyte and glycogen in potassium homeostasis in the brain is a common knowledge. We see here that in vivo, in the, in the, in the mouse brain, if we inhibit glycogen, the concentration of potassium goes up. And this is a profound uh, implication of the excitability of neurons. So you have uh, an increased uh, susceptibility to cortical spreading depression. And also there are some studies suggesting the same for epilepsy. So another common knowledge is that glycogen is, is very, very important for the, uh, for the learning process. So here you see that uh, when you inhibit glycogen, you, you basically uh, block the consolidation of memory and the retrieval of information. And we have a, a lot of studies about this, uh, this role of glycogen and you see they are mostly um, published in the last 10 years. So the, these studies were um, con commonly interpreted uh, using the lactate, uh, the, the astrocyte neuron lactate shuttle. But during the same fr time frame, uh, it, um, it was uh, it was it, it emerged that lactate has also signaling uh, signaling role. So there are receptors of lactate in the brain and they and so the increase in lactate inhibits the neuronal activity so there this is another example uh, the, in which you have a metabolite like uh, lactate that becomes a transmitter um, so uh, so then how is uh, is important which, which is the role of glycogenolysis so, so more this is a study is a, a modeling studies we didn't do any experiment here um, as more than 10 years ago we proposed uh, based on mathematical modeling that when the astrocyte use glycogen they stop using glucose leaving more glucose for neuronal utilization this is uh, i'm talking about of course the glucose which uh, originates from the blood so is um, um, yeah, uh, so this model, it, essentially, it's, uh, you know, we have the ambition that this model will become the, the standard to explain the neurometabolic cobbling. We are pretty ambitious about that. So uh, the idea is that when astrocytes use glycogen, they help neurons to take up the potassium in, in, in the extracellular space. And at the same time, they stop using glucose uh, so that the neurons have more glucose to, 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 you know, to, to do their, their uptake. Yeah. Um, okay, um, so it took, it, it took like 10 years to get noticed about that. But uh, eventually we were uh, contacted by Jerry Aldinel of the University of Kansas and Douglas Rothman of the University of Yale. And we established a collaboration with them and we extended this model with their ideas also. And uh, basically what we did is uh, reinterpreting uh, three decades of uh, experiments uh, of uh, uh, carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy, obtaining an excellent fit with the experimental data um, between the experimental data and the predictions of the model. So basically what happens is that at some point here, uh, uh, which is when they are stimulated, astrocytes start to do, uh, to metabolize glycogen. So uh, it is kind of a switch that happens. So, so we asked why, yeah, okay, why there is this switch. And uh, we started using a um, phenomenological model of short term plasticity, basically is the nonlinear relationship that there is between the input and the output of, of a neuronal population. And we see that this ratio has something to do with the energy expanded. So then using a um, metabolic model, we showed that the input component is using oxygen while the output component is uh, using glucose and producing lactate in a manner which kind of resembles, you know, the steep curve. So basically we have an hypothesis. If we can modulate the ratio between the input and output in vivo, we may be able perhaps to test our prediction. And uh, we uh, found this into, we have found uh, inspiration uh, um, in the way the brain uh, processes the visual information uh, and especially using the so-called these aluminum chromatic flickering. When you um, flash it, uh, in, uh, at, at, at relatively low frequency, two stimulus that are the same luminance, but different color, the brain process the information and transfer the information to the primary visual cortex. And from then, the primary visual cortex then uh, project to 
the so-called secondary visual areas and the flickering uh, is perceived. But if you increase the frequency above the critical frequency, frequency that for chromatic flickering is around 25 Hertz, the information still reaches the primary visual cortex, but the primary visual cortex do not transmit to other areas and the flickering is not perceived. So you basically do, you do, do not perceive alternating images, but the brain just fused the imaging into a static picture. So uh, we did the experiment and uh, we were able using the functional MRI that we have the same bold, which is actually the same input uh, in V1, but different output, uh, which we used uh, uh, the input in the secondary visual areas to, to, to get this information. And using the uh, functional uh, NMR spectroscopy, we actually see that only during the perceived flicker, flickering, uh, we got an increase in the lactate, while there is no increase during the unperceived fl flickering, which means that it, it, there is something to do with the input out balance. So basically, uh, metabolism is telling us something that has to do with the way of uh, in which the brain processes information, which is according to us something that relates to what we call brain function. Okay, this is the team that deserves. Uh, thank you, uh, thanks, and thank you for your attention again. Thank you, Mauro. If there is some question, please. Six. No, no, this is no, 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 nice talk. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's a surprise because I, I didn't know nothing about that. So I, I know that the astrocytes <laughs> have a role, but in particular, this uh, ability in controlling the uh, extracellular, extracellular reproduction seems to be amazing. And, and you, you think this is uh, very much related to the uh, homeostatic processes determining the sleep wake cycle, for instance, uh, is absolutely. There is a, a paper in Science, I think, a couple of years ago. I can I can give you the reference. They showed basically that the uh, the, the sleep wake transition is actually governed by the tiny change in the ionic composition of the extracellular fluid. So basically, potassium goes up and down 0.3 millimolar something like that. And they also show that the, it is difficult, if not impossible to change that based on, you know, interfering with neurons. So they don't say in the paper, but I worked in that laboratory. So <laughs> I see what's going on. And there is, you know, a suggestion is there's probably astrocyte governing also that transition. You know, because actually potassium is very, is tightly related to the, uh, uh, all the phenomena related to adaptation and, uh, and, and, and controlling the, uh, uh, again, uh, self-inhibition, which is uh, the way in which the low oscillations occur. And uh, when, I, when I, I, I showed the, the change of state in the brain, actually what I changed is the, the role of potassium in, in, in some way. Yeah. And, and it is- Yeah, there is a, is, a, is a very complex, of course, because there are plenty of channels that are involved in that, in that transition both in neurons and in astrocytes. And then there is the involvement of the subcortical structures. First of all, the logocerulus. So norepinephrine governs the, uh, what is happening to potassium. Uh, I think there, there is a bunch of papers about that and also uh, about the effect of norepinephrine but on potassium, no, also, this is probably useful for, for Sylvia, which is uh, uh, drastically impacting on the, on, the vol on the extracellular space volume. So uh, maybe it, w it could be nice to study, you know, something related to anomalous diffusion or whatever, non-normal diffusion uh, during the sleep-wake transition. Or maybe if you don't, if you if studying sleep is difficult, but you can study anesthesia in animals. It's pretty easy. Thank you very much. Uh, the, quest the last question. 